Welcome to Hard Talk on the BBC World Service with me, Stephen Sacker. My guest today is a career diplomat who broke with the traditions of his profession by quitting his post with a very public swipe at his own government's policies. Robert Ford served three years as US ambassador to Syria. A veteran Arabist previously stationed in Iraq, he was a strong advocate of offering strong US military support to the so-called moderate rebel forces trying to overthrow the Assad regime. The Obama administration, though adamant that Assad must go, never followed his advice. And by the time Ambassador Ford left the State Department in 2014, Syria was deeply fragmented with a substantial chunk of the country in the hands of the extreme jihadist group calling itself Islamic State. US warplanes have been attacking IS positions for the past year. But in recent weeks, the battlefield has become even more complicated because Russia has launched its own military campaign against what it calls terrorist targets in an effort to shore up the Assad regime. So Syria has become the setting for another trial of strength between Washington and Moscow and the stage for a potentially disastrous proxy war. It's a major strategic headache for Barack Obama. Does he have a coherent response? Well, Robert Ford joins me now on the line from Hanover in New Hampshire. Ambassador Ford, welcome to Hard Talk. Nice to be with you. Let me start with this dramatic escalation of Russian military involvement in Syria. It has been widely described as a game changer. Is that your assessment? No, not at all. Two things on that, Stephen. First, the Russian close air support to the Assad army has helped the Assad army gain some ground, but not very much, and they've taken quite a few casualties as they try to advance, especially to the south of Aleppo. Uh, but in the end, it's not changing the military balance very much. And the essential dynamic of the Syrian civil war, that the Assad regime is slowly losing a war of attrition, uh, that really doesn't change. The Assad manpower shortage is still the dominant issue in terms of the battlefield balance of power over the long run. And yet, and yet, we now read that the Iranians are considering putting significant numbers of troops on the ground in Syria. As you've just referred to it, the Russians aren't just, as Mr. Putin says, hitting terrorist targets, but they seem to be operating in close support of Syrian Assad ground forces. So how can you be so confident that this is not going to change the military dynamic over the next few weeks and months? Because the Russians have said they're in it for the next few months at least. Well, let's see if they are. Uh, it's early days yet. Uh, this war has been going on for a very long time. And in the end, the Assad government and the community that it draws the majority of its support from, the Alawi community in Syria, has already taken thousands and thousands of casualties. And it was only about 12 to 14 percent of the population when this started. So I think over the long term, in a war of attrition, majority usually wins. The Iranians can send in troops. They've already sent in thousands of troops Stephen, they have sent in thousands of Iraqi Shia militia people that they mobilized, that they took to Iran and trained, that they flew in to Damascus. They have, the Iranians have sent in Hezbollah fighters, five, six, seven thousand of them. So they're going to send in a few thousand more. You might ask yourself, where's Hezbollah in all of this? And the answer is Hezbollah has literally uh, worn itself out in the fighting. And so the Iranians are trying to find other people. It's a war of attrition. That's the most important thing to understand, and that in this war of attrition, the minority side generally does not fare well over the long term. Do you see that, I mean, you're a veteran of, of Middle East diplomacy, and till last year, of course, you were the State Department's uh, envoy on Syria and diplomat, I mean, ambassador, even though you couldn't actually be in Damascus. So you've obviously thought a great deal about what the Russians are up to in Syria. Do you see this as a as a desperate gamble or a very clear-headed strategic move by Putin? Well, I don't think it signals as big a change as some people have written because the Russians have been sending large amounts of material 
support to the Bashar al-Assad government ever since the conflict began in 2011, and of course, close Russian military support to the Syrian government uh, dates back decades to the time of uh, the 1967 and 1973 wars. So what's different is that rather than just sending in arms and advisors, they're actually undertaking combat operations, and that is for sure an escalation, but I don't think it's a gigantic change. Why did they do it? And to me, the answer is very clear. The Assad government, military, their security forces were beginning to crumble, and the Russians intervened quickly to stabilize them. Is there not common ground here? I mean, Vladimir Putin and Sergei Lavrov on the Russian side say that there most clearly is common ground in the sense that the United States appears to believe that the greatest threat facing U.S. national interests in Syria today is so-called Islamic State. The Russians say that they are going after terrorist groups and Islamic State is clearly on their list of terror groups inside Syria. So you would think, would you not, that there is clear scope for Russian-American coordination and cooperation? Uh, there might be, uh, but there is uh, two major obstacles to Russian-American cooperation. The first is that the primary Russian goal is not to fight the Islamic State. Most of their combat air operations are not directed against the Islamic State. They're directed against other, more moderate, nationalist armed opposition elements that were directly threatening the Assad regime. I think the Russians are concerned about the Islamic State, but it's very much a secondary uh, concern. And with respect to how to manage the Islamic State problem, which the United States also agrees is a problem, the Russian analysis is it has to be through a security, a hard fist security policy, whereas the United States believes that there has to be a political element because the Bashar al-Assad government's brutality has spurred recruitment into the Islamic State. So while the Russians want to preserve Bashar al-Assad, the American government is at best ambivalent about Bashar al-Assad and therefore cooperation in terms of helping the Russians prop up Bashar al-Assad, uh, that is much more difficult for Washington. But uh, Putin's bottom line seems to be, look, we need to stabilize the situation in Syria, not least because of the massive refugee crisis, which is destabilizing the region and threatens to destabilize Europe as well. But the only way to deliver stabilization is to work with the quote-unquote legitimate government in Syria and to begin a negotiating process that brings in all the regional actors as well as obviously the United States and the Russians and the Europeans. Now the Europeans seem to buy into that. I spoke to the German well, defense minister the other nice day and she said yes let's get all the partners around the table. So why isn't that happening? Well we actually tried to do that Stephen in January and February of 2014. I'm sure you remember the effort to establish a Geneva negotiation in January and February of 2014. We managed to get the Syrian opposition, including uh, representatives of armed opposition groups, to Geneva. They put forward on the table, in writing, to the United Nations Special Envoy, at the time it was Lakhtar Brahimi, a proposal that said, we are willing to negotiate a new national unity transition government, and we do not insist at the beginning of negotiations that Bashar al-Assad stepped down. We are willing even to negotiate that. The Syrian government delegation's response was, we are not prepared to negotiate anything political. The Russians could have. We actually asked them to do so in January and February of 2014. The Russians could have leaned on the Syrian government to begin that negotiation. The Russian delegation in Geneva declined to do that in February 2014, and that is why the Geneva effort quickly collapsed. Well, so indeed, it's great I mean, for Mr. Putin to say, hey, we need to negotiate this, but they had their chance a year and a half ago. They didn't do it. The essential problem here is that what the Russians want is basically cosmetic changes to the Syrian government, and they're, they're putting up a lot of conditions. Cannot have Bashar al-Assad step down, they say. Uh, the Iranians, by the way, say the same thing. Whereas the Syrian opposition and the United States, and I think most countries who have a view similar to that of the United States, including Britain, including other countries in Europe, is that all things with respect to a new national unity government, a transition government, if you will, have to be 
non-negotiable. There are no preconditions. There is no precondition that Assad go, just as there is no precondition but, that Assad must stay. Right. All things must but, be up to Syrians to negotiate. But, Ambassador, isn't the truth that you've perhaps glided over in, in that assessment? The truth is that you actually became seriously out of step with the Obama administration on strategy in Syria because you were adamant that the only uh, right and proper course for, these, for the United States was to insist that Assad must go, but in particular to arm and fully support the quote-unquote moderate uh, rebel forces in Syria at a time when the Obama administration had clearly decided that there were no viable, credible, moderate forces in Syria and that in private and indeed in conversations that I had with senior administration officials they began to say you know what the worst thing in the world for us right now would be for Assad to be toppled. You didn't agree with that assessment but that's the way the Obama administration went. I couldn't disagree more Stephen with your assessment and here's why. Number one the American administration, I have heard President Obama say it many times, I've heard Secretary Kerry say it many times, is that Assad should let a transition go forward. He should step aside and allow a transition to go forward. And that is the President of the United States speaking, Stephen, not some unnamed administration source that you may have talked to. The policy is that. Notice that that policy does not say when he should go. None of us have ever said that Assad must step down as a precondition to negotiating. We fully understood that Assad would send a delegation to Geneva to negotiate that transitional government that I was talking about. There was nothing about Assad stepping down before negotiations, just as there was nothing that said Assad should stay after negotiations. It's not up to the Americans. It's not up to the Russians. It's not up to the Iranians. It's not up to Saudi Arabia when Assad goes. Syrians have to negotiate that. Now, with respect to arming, there is nothing contradictory about negotiating on one track and at the same time working military pressure on the other track. That has happened in plenty of wars, plenty of civil wars, and plenty of negotiations. The Russians understand that. The Assad government understands that. The Iranian government understands that. The whole point of this, however, is that there is not a military victory. There is ultimately the only way to end this is through a negotiation. But, but isn't it time to acknowledge that your faith in the potential of the so-called moderate free Syrian army based forces was misplaced because what we have seen unfold in recent months and years is that even when those forces have been given some support and some weaponry they have miserably failed. I mean the most signal example being the training, the new recruits that were trained up by the United States put back onto the battlefield. There were only 50 of them in the first instance and Within a few days, all but four or five had been killed or kidnapped. They were, to be frank about it, useless. I totally agree with you, Stephen, that that particular program, which was under the Department of Defense, was an abysmal failure, and, and people like me warned the administration that they would not be able to find enough Syrian fighters to fight only the Islamic State and guarantee to the United States that they would not use arms they received against the Bashar al-Assad government. Since the Bashar al-Assad government's forces are killing seven to eight times as many civilians as the Islamic State, I think the American precondition there was never reasonable from the outset. And we warned them about that. I spoke in congressional testimony in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in September 2014 about that. So yes, that program was a failure. However, Stephen, there is another program it's not a secret that the CIA has been providing assistance to armed opposition elements, and those fighters, by contrast, have done quite well. So well, in fact, that finally the Russians had to come in with air power to try to stabilize the Assad forces, which have been pretty much in steady retreat throughout calendar year 2015 until the Russian air operations Yeah, began. but the problem is, Ambassador, that the groups that you want to see the U.S. supporting seem from time to time to suffer major defections to either the Nusra Front, which is affiliated with Al-Qaeda, or to Islamic State itself. And we know that U.S. weaponry is also reaching either Nusra Front or Islamic State. So isn't there the danger, if the U.S. continues to put weaponry into the field, that it will fall into the hands of those that the U.S. regards as the main strategic threat to themselves in Syria? 
first of all, the moderate opposition groups that we have been helping, very little of what we have given them has actually fallen into the hands of the Islamic State or the Nusra Front. A small portion of it has, Stephen. I absolutely agree with that, but the vast majority has not. Uh, let's just talk about special anti-tank missiles of American manufacturer that have reached these moderate groups. The Nusra Front has only gotten a handful of them, while dozens and dozens have gone to moderate opposition groups and have used them with great effect. In fact, um, if your research staff would check the latest fighting on the ground, they would see that the Assad government has lost several dozen tanks during their offensive operations started after the Russians began their bombing campaign. So, in fact, the moderate groups are using the weaponry that various countries, um, including the United States, have provided. They're using it to great effect. I find it always very odd that the Western media plays up so much uh, the Islamic State and the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria, the Nusra Front, and basically ignores what the moderates well, and nationalist I, you know, groups that, are doing. It, you know, it's it's, a, it's, a it's fair been point remarkable to, to me. It, well, it's, a, it's an interesting and fair point to make. Let me ask you bluntly then, when we're talking about groups like Ahra al-Sham, the Free Men of Syria organization, which mm -hmm. is one of the most powerful, mm -hmm. it seems, groups that you would call moderate, is it really moderate when a, a group like that proclaims its desire to see Sharia law uh, as the driving force of a future Syria, which uh, clearly makes comments which suggest mm -hmm. that Alawites and Christians would find it very difficult to find a place in their Syria. Are, are these moderates? You regard this as moderation? Um, this is how I define a moderate in the Syrian context, Stephen. A moderate is a group that accepts that there has to be a political negotiation and that there has to be a political process after a transition government is set up to determine the future permanent government of Syria. And a moderate group is one that accepts that there must be pluralism in that process. And a moderate group is one that works with other groups and other factions in a pluralistic setting. I don't agree at all with Ahrar al-Sham's desire to set up an Islamic state, but I have to admit that they accept that there needs to be a political negotiation. I have to admit that they are willing to work with other groups, and they do on the ground to great effect. That's one of the reasons they're as strong as they are, as you mentioned, Stephen. Uh, it's not a group that I'd ever want my daughter to marry into. I don't agree with their vision of society, but I would not call them jihadis. They're not looking to impose an Islamic state at sword point, different, therefore, from al-Qaeda, different, therefore, from the Islamic state. And they are willing to accept even such things as a parliament or some kind of government institution. So yes, they want Sharia, but the kind of Sharia they want may, in fact, in the end, not look like the kind of Sharia that the Islamic State is uh, All right. already imposing over most of central and eastern Syria. Ambassador, we're running short of time. I've got some questions about the wider region, but just one more on Syria, then we must move on. So let's make it brief as we can. Yeah. You quit the State Department last year saying that you were deeply frustrated with the Obama administration and that you could no longer justify the policy that you saw being made in the White House. Are you any less frustrated today? Do you see any more clarity and decisiveness from the Obama administration? I think we still have the essential problem from a year and a half ago, which is that the administration wants to get to a political negotiation, to get to that unity transition government that I was talking about. But its tactics are not strong enough to compel the Assad government to negotiate. Its tactics are not strong enough to compel the Russians and the Iranians to bring their Assad allies to the negotiating table. And so until they change the tactics and get tougher, it's like a wish for a political negotiation rather than a strategy that they're actually trying to implement. Isn't the lesson of the last four years, not just in Syria, but in Iraq as well, in Libya, in Yemen, and arguably to a certain extent in Egypt as well. Isn't the lesson that when you uh, support the removal, the toppling of repressive authoritarians or dictators, what you do is not unleash powerful forces of democratic freedom, but you unleash sectarianism and extremism. And isn't that a very painful lesson that it's taken the Americans a very long time to learn? Uh, with all due respect, I spent five years in Iraq, and the sectarianism there was extremely regrettable. It's still going on, but Iraq and Syria are not the same, and I wouldn't draw 
every single parallel from Iraq and try to apply it into Syria. The sectarianism in Syria developed not because of anything the United States or Turkey or even Saudi Arabia did. The sectarianism developed in Syria because, let's be honest, Alawi soldiers were firing on predominantly Sunni demonstrators, although there were Christians and Alawis in those peaceful demonstrations as well. The regrettable fact is that something like 80% of the Syrian military's officer corps in 2011, 80% were Alawi. Now remember that the Alawi community is only about 12 to 14% of the population. So not surprisingly, the demonstrators quickly understood that the Alawi community was attacking them. And the sectarianism developed from the brutality of these basically Alawi-dominated security forces, brutality applied to what were peaceful demonstrators at the time. That's where the uh, sectarianism came from. It has nothing to do right, with well, anything you, the Americans you, did you, or any other foreign group. You, your answer, you brought it back very specifically to Syria. I want to end with a big picture question. We've just heard that the U.S. administration is not going to pull all its forces out of Afghanistan by 2016. It's going to extend the mission. We also mm -hmm. see that Obama, after all of his mandate to pull back from Iraq and elsewhere, has got U.S. forces again in Iraq. There is U.S. bombing in Syria. It does look as though Obama's mission to draw in America's forces from their presences in the Middle East and elsewhere, it's failed. And I wonder if you can tell me why you think Obama has failed in that mission. Uh, the mission is very difficult to achieve. I'm not enthusiastic about American bombing in Syria in an open-ended campaign. I would much prefer that Syrians be doing that fighting without any American Air Force. In Iraq, we don't have forces in combat missions, Stephen, but they are on the ground providing training both to Iraqi army and increasingly to Kurdish and Sunni fighters as well. And in Afghanistan, we have had people again that are providing training to Afghan forces who clearly still need it. It is just very hard to build up reliable local indigenous security forces. I think it doesn't look like it might be difficult at the onset of the mission, but as time goes on, you learn that the cultural differences, the incentives that are offered to the local forces can really make this difficult. May I add one other point on this, Stephen, which is I have no doubt that people in the administration feel frustrated that they have not been able to withdraw all American combat forces from Afghanistan. I'm very sure the president wanted to do that. But on the other hand, he's not under heavy American public pressure to bring every last soldier out of Afghanistan. All right. With that thought, we have to end. But Ambassador Robert Ford, thank you very much for joining me on Hard Talk. That was an edition of Hard Talk presented by me, Stephen Sacker. For details of our complete range of podcasts and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts.